Okay, what we what we did on those two recorded lessons is took you through three things. There's the philosophy of renormalization, there's a technique, and then there's a very specialized technique of doing loop integrals. So let's just quickly step through them. So one, the philosophy. Okay, the philosophy is basically that you you express predictions in using measured values. Use measured parameters. Instead of the ones that appear directly in the Lagrangian. And so in the case that we did there we were doing phi phi scattering which had, had various loop diagrams like that plus dot dot dot. We had the function in terms of the kinematic variables minus 6i lambda 0. That's the bare one that sits in the Lagrangian. That's the term that, that you start with in the Lagrangian. And in perturbation theory this came to be 1 half minus 6i lambda 0 squared, so order squared, some integral which will recover a little bit of um, plus order lambda zero cubed. Okay, so that's that's our expression here. And the S T and U I hope everyone remembers S is the center of mass energy squared, T is the momentum transfer squared, and U is the last kinematic variable. Okay. And what we d chose to do, what I, I talked about various things, but I chose to renormalize or measure at S is T is equal to U is equal to zero. And we did that by saying that the matrix element there is defined to be minus six I lambda renormalized. Okay, that's our, just a definition. And this is what we call a, a renormalization scheme. And the scheme means we've chosen some kinematic point to do the measurement. And then we end up with M is minus 6 I lambda renormalized the plus 1 half minus 6 I lambda renormalized squared. And then over here, it's delta I of S plus delta I of T plus delta I of U plus order lambda renormalized cubed, where this delta I is I of S minus I of zero. Okay? So now if if I set ST and U equal to zero, these deltas are all zero. I get my renormalization condition, et cetera. Okay. So that's that's the, the product. And then in the couple steps down here, we did these, and so we now have an explicit formula in terms of a measurement that we can use. Okay. Questions about that part? Okay, that's the that's the basic heart of renormalization. The the second thing I did though is a technique, which is this counter term method. Okay. And that's that's that says counter term there. Counter term method is is instead of starting out the way we just did there, where we use the bare Lagrangian. So you start with your Lagrangian having some parameter lambda zero over four phi to the fourth. That's the bare guy again. You write that in terms of minus lambda renormalized over four, the physical guy. Phi to the fourth plus the change delta lambda. It's actually minus lambda delta lambda over four is what I used. Phi to the fourth. And this is our counter term. 
And then there's a new Feynman rule. The which you where you draw some funny other little picture like like that little blob or something. Now let's do it better. A little blob like that is minus um, six i delta lambda. It, but now you've done perturbation theory. theory from the start using lambda, using the physical one, okay? And then at the end you choose delta lambda such to enforce the renormalization condition. Okay, in this case delta lambda was a minus um, minus 6 i lambda it's actually 1 6 because that's that piece of that 6 right there the 6 in, in the delta lambda um, times 3 i of 0 okay now what th this is a, this looks a little bit confusing. I mean, a little backwards. We we start with lambda zero, make it into lambda r, have this new term, and choose the new term. And how can you choose the new term? Well, basically, though, the point is that we have no idea what lambda zero is. But we we do know what lambda r is because we've measured it. And so the delta lambda is the difference between lambda zero and lambda r, and so we chose it to be whatever it has to be to make the renormalization condition be what it what we've wanted it to be. In other words, we discover what it has to be, what lambda zero has to be. Okay, so that's that's the technique. We'll do another couple examples with that. But any other questions about that part? Okay, and the third thing that we did in one of this is we did the loop integral. And this is just a, so far, as far as I did it there, it's just a, a math project. You have that loop, you have that formula for that loop integral, it's a, messy formula, and you do all sorts of gymnastics, math gymnastics, to get it to work, and we come out with something that looks like delta i, how it's called, delta i of p squared, some momentum, is minus i over 32 pi squared, 2 plus p squared minus 4m squared over p squared, so 1 half, log, and it's just interesting to see these things, minus p minus p squared minus 4m squared to 1 half over p plus that. No. Plus i pi. And this is the case when p squared is bigger than 4m squared. And there's other forms, you know, this, if, it, if p squared is less than zero, it starts off the same way, it starts off like that, there's the two is the same, but then it becomes plus 4m squared minus p squared over magnitude of p log, and then the log gets, sort of gets reversed, it becomes the square root of 4m squared minus p squared minus p over square root plus p. And there's no i pi there. So that's for p squared less than 0. And if 0 is less than p squared is less than 4m squared, there's another form 
10. I, I, let me just, just tell you that it involves the 10 minus 1. Okay, so I wrote all those out in the last notes. I don't, I'm not trying to be too careful here. And part of what I'm going to do today is to explain a little bit about this. This is, so this, we've done, done these are really complicated integrals, really. When you need to get anything that comes out looking like this, so there's an imaginary part here, there's no imaginary part here. It goes from logs to inverse tangents. They're, they're pretty messy integrals. They're, they're ones that Mathematica doesn't do a good job on, okay? And part of what I'm going to talk about in a little bit is how to know when Mathematica is screwed up and how to be smarter than Mathematica on this case. Because if, very, if you plug it in there, you're going to get the wrong answer a lot of the time. So you have to know when to see when, what's going on there. Okay, so those are the those are the three big lessons from the past stuff. Questions? So, I I do want to say before I move on just some again about the way we did it. You'll find there's two basic procedures. Okay. The if you look in a book, some of the books are going to do it exactly the way we just did that, and some books are going to do it differently. So you have to know that because you have to recognize it. What we just did is BPH renormalization. Okay. This is the one with the counter terms. just like we just did. Um, BPH, BP, and H is Bogoyubov, Parisic, and Hep. Okay, so that's why it's called BPH, because no one wants to say that too many times. Um, it's, its beauty is that it only uses then its perturbation theory in the physical parameters. because we've shifted the Lagrangian from having this bare parameter to having the physical one, and we then do perturbation theory in that. So that's a plus. That's really quite nice. And it uses the physical masses everywhere. We haven't addressed the masses yet, but... That's a plus. It's also very good to do higher orders. Okay. Again, you you have to these counter terms then be, get corrections at higher orders, but the procedure is fine. The the other way doesn't really have a name. I'll just call it conventional. Okay, and that's basically you start with the pair parameters. So you start with the bare parameters, and you do perturbation theory. So with them, you know, so your expansion is in terms of the bare parameters. Then you identify the physical parameters. Those faculty over there are uh, they're having too much fun. They're not supposed to be having fun. Identify the physical parameters after you've done the calculation. And then and then go back and redo redo express everything. You in the physical ones.
Okay, you can see that this is going to be painful at higher orders because you're going to have to do the whole calculation to high orders, and then you have to do a bunch of algebra to really resort it out. It doesn't sort out very well. At, at first order, either one of these works out about the same. But I choose to teach with this one because, one, it's, it's not as immediately intuitive. This one, in some ways, is more intuitive. And so it's a good thing to use in the classroom so that you get to see it because we can work on the intuition if we, as much as we need to. Um, but it also has the nice feature that we're using everything in terms of the physical parameters, and I like that part also. So which one I use in practice? You know, I do these calculations all the time. Sometimes I do one, sometimes I do the other. But, you know, they're, unless you're doing high orders, they're basically the same. Okay. So that's just some, some sociology there. Here's some now some physics. And this is going to be on the imaginary parts. Okay. If you if you go back the the integral that we had to do there, delta i of p squared was the following integral. It was minus i p squared over 32 pi squared, integral 0 to 1, integral over the Feynman parameterization, 1 minus z, 1 minus 2z, that's, that's the boring stuff, and then it was m squared minus z, 1 minus z, p squared plus i, minus i epsilon. Okay, that, that, that's what the integral you had to do. And this is the one that Mathematica fails on a lot. And the, the big trick associated with this, the thing you have to watch when you're doing these, is, well, it has to do with that i epsilon. You're, and it has to do with the fact that, that depending on the kinematics here, this thing could have a pole. And that's, that's really, the, the key features. Um, the imaginary part is associated with the i epsilon. Okay? If, if i epsilon were, okay, there, there's an overall factor of i out in front here. That, that's not what I'm counting on. Okay? So let's just drop that guy for the moment. Not worry about that. The imaginary part in the integral comes from the i epsilon because if I didn't have the i epsilon there, everything's real. So that i epsilon suddenly, after being carried along for all this time, occasionally it dictates our contours for us. That that guy plays a role now. But you can you can sort of see the physics is going to be that if if this thing never gets close to the pole, so if p let's imagine p squared was less than zero, or if p squared is very small, close to zero, then this thing never gets close to the pole, and so epsilon can be set to zero very easily. But when you go through the pole, the, the uh, i epsilon suddenly plays a role, and that, the, that gives us the ima imaginary parts. But there's real physics in that. So let's just do, so first, the first thing I want to do is where are the imaginary parts? Okay. Well, first, what is p squared? p squared is either s, t, or u. Okay, and here's where we can go back to our kinematic variables. Uh, this is one, two, three, four. S is P one plus P two squared. Okay, and you can go to the center of mass, and that's then E center of mass squared. That's the center of mass energy. That in a reaction is always bigger than zero. Okay. 
if you do T is P1 minus P3 squared. Okay. If you go to the center of mass for that, these guys all have equal mass, right? And in the center of mass, then, the energies, the two incoming energies and the two outgoing energies are exactly the same. They come in with some energy. They go out at a different en angle. So since this is equal to E1 minus E3 squared minus P1 vector minus P3 squared, E1 and E3 are going to be the same in the center of mass. Okay. So T in the center of mass is going to be less than zero. Okay. So T is a negative number in the center of mass. And since it's a Lorentz invariant, it's a negative number in any frame. So T is always less than zero. And U U is P1 minus P4 squared by the same argument is also less than zero. Okay, so if you look at that integral there, you're going to know that delta I of T and delta I of U are going to be real. You can just set epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so that's, that's just a nice, it's actually, maybe, may I, actually I have to write it as I delta T. Okay, so there's, in other words, the, the imaginary part, what I've been calling the imaginary part, is zero. Okay, um, but I of S is not necessarily that case. But for S, you have to look at the maximum value of z1 minus z. Okay, so that runs from 0 to 1. z runs from 0 to 1. The maximum value, this is symmetric uh, around, around z equals to a half. And the maximum value is when it's a half. So it's a half times a half. Maximum value of that is a quarter. So there's no pole if S is less less than um, so no pole in I of S if S is less than four m squared. Okay. So if this is S, this is the maximum of a quarter. This thing stays away from the pole. From the and the pole, the pole, is, the pole comes then for s bigger than 4m squared. Okay, but s is the center of mass energy, and it's always bigger than 4m squared. So I of s is always going to, in this case, is always going to have a pole. And the the Feynman diagram that we draw there is the following. One, 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 two, three, four. This has delta i of s or i of s, whichever you care. There's a pole right there. Okay. So the imaginary part is going to de develop for that diagram and right there. Okay, so that's math. The second part of this, uh, let's see, am I doing A's or, or one? I'm doing A, B, so B. The second part of this is physics. Why is, why is there imaginary part there? Okay, and the, the answer goes by the phrase of unitarity. Okay, which is a it refers to the fact that there's a physical intermediate state. Which is on shell. 
Okay, on shell means it satisfies the usual energy and momentum relations. Okay, and here's how the the formal proof goes. It's, it's here's the formal proof. Okay, so we have this S matrix. The S matrix is the transition from taking a state in an initial state i, transitioning it to time t equals to plus infinity, and coming to some final state. Okay, so that's as a matrix is is that the S, S is unitary. Okay, so the, the statement is S dagger S is 1. And what does that mean? Well, it means that, so it's S, S, um, F, I dagger, and let's make that one an I prime, S F I summed over F equals delta I I prime. Okay, that's, this, if, if this is a matrix with indexes I and F, the matrix multiplication, calling that 1, means this. I start with I, I go to F, take S dagger, I sum over F, and I end up with I prime there. Okay, that's, that's the matrix multiplication of that. Okay, if you plug that in there, it becomes I prime, U dagger, F, F, U, I, okay, the, I'm suppressing the infinities there. This guy becomes 1 because that's a complete set of states. Then u dagger u becomes 1, and this, so this becomes i prime i, which is delta i i prime. Okay. So the the statement of unitary, that is just the statement that this time development operator is unitary and this space form a complete state. So, okay, so that's, that's a bit of formalism. And then we've defined S is 1 minus I T. Okay, we're, where we we we've been using our t is this two pi to the fourth delta four of energy conservation m over these two omega i's. Okay, so we when we calculated this guy, we started off with one which is just the, the first piece in that exponential. And then everything else we called M, the matrix element, so it's 1 minus I T, where T is this matrix element. Okay? So, if, everyone remember that? You're comfortable enough with that? Any questions about that? Okay, remember, this guy was the time-ordered exponential of of the interaction Hamiltonian, so it starts off with one, and all the interactions have been put into this M. Okay, so S dagger S is one plus I T dagger minus I T plus T dagger T, and that's equal to one. So that says that T minus t dagger is minus i t dagger t.
Okay, so T dagger T is then is sum over, let's call it J, T, T, T I J, T dagger uh, J F. So if this is I F or F I, Now, what what is this? This all the, this is just a bunch of looks like a bunch of manipulations to you, but it's exactly what you see up above. This this piece here becomes the imaginary part of M. The imaginary part of M, the first order. Here's here is the imaginary part of M. It's then the some overall physical states that you know, let, let me just write this thing as phi phi goes to phi phi so all physical states in this case there's only one squared Okay, so what this says is that the imaginary part is the square of something where you start in your initial state, you go to some other state, and then you come back to your final state. Okay? That's exactly what we saw up in this picture here. Okay? In this picture here, the imaginary part of this phi phi scattering, phi phi goes to phi phi, is the square of the lowest order one. You take Phi phi goes to phi phi on shell. Phi phi goes to phi phi again. So it's really just the square of this amplitude. So it generally, you get imaginary parts in a scattering amplitude when there's physical intermediate states that can be on shell. Okay, so the this calculation that we did satisfied that. This picture gave us an uh, imaginary part. But that's, you then have to know to look for that. You basically, anytime you're doing a calculation in one loop, you look to see where are there going to be imaginary parts, because that's the place where mathematics is going to fail you and where you're going to have to work harder. Okay. And so it's, it's actually sort of pretty. I mean, here, this looks disconnected from drawing, doing that diagram, but it's really the consistency of the, the, the whole formalism that tells us that this formal statement about unitarity of the S matrix comes back very explicitly in the, um, in the amplitude. I should mention that at the moment in field theory, one of the hot developments going on is ways that are, are now for very complicated integrals that are needed for the LHC and stuff, things like that, are we're replacing the techniques of actually doing Feynman diagrams out because it's just too painful to do sometimes by doing this where you find all the intermediate states and you just square tree amplitudes and you write out the imaginary parts and you can get end up guessing the real parts sometimes from that and that's the way people do it's a forefront area right now in trying to figure out ways to do very complicated Feynman diagrams it works extremely well in gauge theories it's a little it has a little bit of a learning curve, but once you've got there, once you're there, you can do incredible calculations that that are just breathtaking to do. Okay. Third thing on this this topic, uh, C is just some techniques. Okay, and the 
techniques actually tie this together a little bit here. I want to go back and look at this guy. So first, I'm going to call, I want to look at that denominator there. Where is the pole? And there's a, so here we've got D, the denominator is, um, well, I'll write it as m squared um, minus p squared 1 minus z, z minus i epsilon. Okay. That's the guy where we're, we've, we've decided that looking for where the pole is tells us about the imaginary parts. But now there's an identity. And you may have seen this identity. If not, you have to really get to know it. 1 over x minus i epsilon is principal value of 1 over x minus i pi delta of x. OK? Well. What does that mean? OK, first, let's just talk about what these terms mean. So here's something that, you, that happens often. These are, happen all the time in propagators, plus or minus i epsilon there. And if I, and actually I've got my identity wrong. It's, it's that way. There's a plus sign there. I'm used to writing this with x plus i epsilon, and then that's a minus i. So just complex conjugated. You, you get the other identity, OK? Um, remind you what this means. Th this is interesting here. here. Here I've got something that has a small parameter epsilon in it. This doesn't look like there's any epsilon there. What's going on? Well, remember, the principal value, the principal value integral, principal value is defined by if the pole is someplace you integrate up to a little bit below the pole let's call it delta minus delta and plus delta around the pole symmetrically around this pole and then you let delta go to zero okay the Okay, so this this guy is going to be the real part of the amplitude. There's no imagine no, no factor of i there, and this part here is the the de the delta function contribution or the imaginary part, and so it comes from the i epsilon. Um, Um, what if 1 over x, well, no, the principle, there, so that you're, you're wondering, uh, will this pole call, give you an infinity when you're integrating? Yes, okay, so yes, good, good, good point. The, the answer is that it doesn't because of this choosing this symmetrically around here. So for, for this function, if you put this in an integral with another function, um, this by choosing this symmetrically about here, you know, the lower end will tend to give you an infinity, the upper end will give you an infinity, and they cancel. Okay? That's, that's basically how it happens. So the principal value is, turns out to be a finite way, of a finite piece of doing an integral. Um, and if you've not seen the integral of this before, the way this is, this is done, the way you, you do this, is you write this as x, um, plus i epsilon over x minus i epsilon, x plus i epsilon, which is then x over x squared plus epsilon squared plus i epsilon over x squared plus epsilon squared. Okay, so that's, that's this is clearly an identity right here. I've just multiplied and divided by the same same thing. And then 
you you do some you do some work. This this thing here, uh, just think about it. Just look at it. it. It looks like a delta function, and it is a representation of a delta function. As epsilon goes to zero, if x was identically equal to zero, this thing blows up as epsilon goes to zero. So the limit as epsilon goes to zero, this blows up if x is equal to zero. But if it, x is anything not equal to zero, it, it, it vanishes. So that looks like a delta function. It's a spike at at x equals to zero. And then the, the other test for a delta function is when you integrate it over, over a small region, including zero, do you get one? And the answer is, if you do this integral, this, this is the, and you get one. It's a hyperbolic tangent. As epsilon goes to zero, it's, it's, it gives you actually pi, or one over pi, when you do it because it's a hyperbolic tangent, and I mean inverse tangent inverse tangent, and so it gives you, a it's a delta function. That's a representation of a delta function. This guy has to take a little bit more work, but um, you then work on this and show that that's the principal value and that's, that's the usual piece. But this is where the delta function piece comes from there, and that's why it doesn't depend on epsilon anymore. As epsilon goes to zero, this limits to a delta function. Okay? Okay, so that's a little technique. But then, that's, so that's a math identity. It's a nice, important math identity. So then, 1 over d, in our, in our formula there, is the principal value of 1 over d, which gives you the real part, minus i pi delta function, or plus i pi delta function, m squared minus p squared z one minus z. Okay, so now again, this tells us exactly what we um, have it calculated, and and what's going on here is that remember z is a maximum of a quarter. So from this identity, you can see that uh, z is, that when, when z, no, when p squared is bigger than 4m squared, this will get satisfied somewhere, right? Because you're integrating over z, um, you'll get a contribution, an imaginary part, when s, p squared is bigger than 4m squared, and it's easy. If you just want to calculate the imaginary part, it's, this is actually an easier way to do it, the easier way than doing that whole integral. Okay. And so you have to watch out for that. That's the piece that Mathematica fails to, to get most of the time. Two, the other thing, to, to, the other thing that's useful, um, the other technique is, is comes from analytic continuation. Okay. And I'm not going to do the whole analytic continuation of that integral there. But he, here's the one that's, that's important. If you have log, let's say log of minus s, let's imagine that that's what you, you have there. Now, if s is, if s is bigger than zero, then that's equal to log of 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 absolute value of s, so which is which is s minus i pi. Okay. Now, how do you get that? Well, it, it's actually a little bit subtle. It's more subtle than I'm going to be here. It's log of e to the minus i pi s. That that e to the minus i pi is minus one. And so, if you 
if you take the, the use the usual product of lo logs, that's log of, of e to the minus no, e, e to the minus i pi plus log f, and that's how you get it. However, that's a bit tricky because I could have also said this is e to the plus i pi times s, and I would have had an opposite sign there. And it actually comes from knowing that the, this comes as log in the Feynman integral is s plus i epsilon. And so you choose some particular sheet. The log has this infinite number of Riemann sheets, if you remember a discussion about the complex structure of log. And so it's, it's the I, pi, I epsilon that dictates which one you do. And I've given you the correct one there. Okay. Okay. And that's actually what you what you end up seeing over there. Uh, if we scroll back up to our there we go back to our integral. Where where is our integral? There we go. So basically, you know, head roughly this this imaginary parts here, they the inside the logs here are, are minus each other. And so analytically continuing from this guy to this guy, you're going from P less than zero to P bigger than zero, and you're getting this, this imaginary part. And I actually see a mistake in what I wrote here, so it's corrected. Um, the, the mistake is right here. Now, let's put another curvy, curvy bracket like that. Okay, the i pi actually multiplies this, this overall p squared. But this i pi is connected to just this analytic continuation. All right. All right. So, mysteries of loops. These things are, are very subtle and very interesting. And there's a lot of physics in them, which I've given you a little bit of a head start. Okay. Questions on that? All right. Then next thing, infinity. Okay. So I, I, I talked you through a whole calculation start to finish there. We did it, there were no infinities. However, there's really a hidden infinity. Okay. And that hidden infinity is in this counter term that I treated perturbatively. It, it had some bunch of stuff and then it had i of zero in it. And even though the final answer didn't have i of zero, it had delta i, which was finite, this guy turns out to be infinite. So we were sort of playing around with something that is formally infinite. i of zero is the following. Integral d4l over 2 pi to the fourth, i of l squared minus m squared plus i epsilon, i of L squared minus M squared plus I epsilon. Basically, the same thing squared. So it comes from something that looks like. Th there's, there's my loop. I just take the momentum equal to zero flowing through the loop. There's two propagators, this propagator and that propagator. And they, there's no, no momentum, so they both have the same factor. Okay. If you, if you, go through the this, this steps we did here. Well, maybe I don't even need to do it here. I'm, I'll do it explicitly at some stage coming up. You can sort of see that this is log divergent as 
this like, you know, dx over x is log divergent. Well, this is d4l over l to the fourth at very high momentum. It ends up being log, log divergent. Okay, we'll calculate it a couple ways. Now, the, the physical results didn't have this. The delta i was finite, which was you know, i of s minus i of 0. Both, both of them are divergent at high energies, and, but their difference is finite. So we didn't have to confront it. But the basic fact is that most many many Feynman many loop integrals are divergent. Okay, so if you just write them out, they're divergent. Okay. Now, before I talk about the field theory philosophy, let's go back and do quantum mechanics. Infinity is in quantum mechanics. Okay. Now, some people think this is special to field theory. In fact, they, these infinities have absolutely nothing to do with field theory. It, they, they happen in quantum mechanics all the time. We just don't normally work hard enough in quantum mechanics. The, the trick in quantum mechanics is it's, we, we do such simple calculations most of the time that we don't even get to find them because it's too painful to do a calculation in quantum mechanics that, that's hard enough where you find it. But here's, here's an example. The, the easy, easiest example to do in quantum mechanics is radiation reaction. in quantum mechanics, okay? So radiation is this. Okay. Radiation, you emit a photon, so you go from some state A to some state A prime by emitting a photon, okay? Radiation reaction is just that thing squared. It's what is the effect of that on, this, on some energy level? So delta of the energy of A is uh, you sum over all intermediate states. You start over here with a state A, some interaction A prime gamma. So I start with A, I end up with A prime gamma. That's my intermediate state. Then I have the A prime gamma some interaction, and I end up back at the state A, and I have an energy denominator Ea minus Ea prime minus E gamma. Okay. So quantum mechanics says if I want to shift over of some energy level, I sum over all intermediate states with energy denominator and potential, some interaction. So we know there's an interaction that causes radiation. So this is a possible intermediate state. And that's that. So this, this diverges badly. We normally don't work hard enough to get it, but beta did it. Beta's calculation. It diverges worse than the field theory calculation. And that's a consequence of non-relativistic kinematics. Uh, non-relativistic kinematics, you know, energies go like p squared. Relativistically, at high energies, they go like p. But non-relativistic kinematics makes this thing diverge worse than it does in field theory. Okay. But this is symptomatic of, of a whole class of things. If you do almost any process at high enough orders in quantum mechanics perturbation theory, 
you run into these divergences. Okay? And it, it raises a philosophical issue. So why do quantum mechanics calculations work? So you all have been probably been spared my rant on this because I always give this in my quantum course. But it's actually something that, that's conceptually interesting. You know, perturbation theory in quantum mechanics says you sum over all intermediate states. Okay, so there's an example. But the trouble with life is that physics is an experimental science. And we don't even know what the, all the intermediate states are. There are other intermediate states here that look like an atom in a Z boson. Yeah, if we were doing this back in the 60s, we wouldn't have known that there was a Z boson there. For all we know, we're going to find that there's a Z prime at the, at the LHC. And we, we needed to put a Z prime in there, too. So in fact, the energy shifts of all these energy levels depend on physics that we have not measured yet. They come from arbitrary high energies. Maybe there's strings. Maybe there's new gauge bosons, all that stuff. And so the, the question I always pose is why, how can we do any quantum calculation if we don't know the intermediate states? And you know, typical answers you get are, well, maybe, maybe these matrix elements disappear. You know, there, maybe there isn't any matrix element with a Z. And the answer is no. Maybe the energy denominators kill it, because when this is a Z boson, it looks suppressed. In fact, no, it, the, the Z boson calculation also contributes an infinite amount, because it diverges also. So all the standard answers are in, fail. Basically, every calculation depends on physics from arbitrary high energies that we don't know yet. Okay? And so then what, why can it work? And the answer is renormalization. Okay. And it comes, the reason this is the answer comes from the uncertainty principle. Okay, so it says that stuff that we don't know okay, whatever it is, Z bosons, anything. The only thing we know about it is that it, it corresponds to very short distances. So it's shorter distances than we've probed, apparently. We haven't, we haven't done anything that probed them. If we haven't probed it, then it looks indistinguishable from being completely local. So anything that comes from high energy looks local to us. Okay. And what does local mean? Local means that it looks like a term in the loyal Lagrangian. Lagrangian or Hamiltonian, if you're doing Hamiltonian formulation. Okay, so that's the only thing we know about it really, is it looks like a local term. But we always start with our, we write out a Lagrangian Lagrangian has parameters. 
for all its terms, you know. It has lambda, it has mass, you know, electric charge, whatever. There are parameters that, that describe all the Lagrangian. And then all the effect, and we measure them. And so all the effect of high energies all the effect of unknown physics at high energies, the stuff that we've never learned about yet, goes into the, the measured values. Okay. So that's in the process of measuring it. We don't know what the bare parameters were. We only know what we measured there. And that includes all this high energy stuff. All these loops go into that. And so there's, there's actually a theorem that's very little discussed. It's the applequist carazone theorem. That, that says that in a field theory, so all effects of high energies Okay, high energy can be either finite or not. Could be infinite, could be finite. We don't really know. But we're insensitive to that because it goes into the renormalized parameters. Which you've measured or is suppressed by powers of the heavy scale. One over, generally one over E heavy squared. Okay. The, part of the theorem doesn't say it couldn't be linear, but almost always is quadratic. So you know, if this is a heavy mass of the Z boson. So this says that if I was to do that quantum mechanical calculation up there, the, the high energy stuff goes into something like the mass of an electron. It's not as obvious up there, but that's what beta taught us. And the residual effects, once you've renormalized and identified the mass of the electron and the electric charge and all those usual things, everything else about the Z goes like 1 over mz squared, or smaller. So this is good news, bad news. It'd be actually lovely if it wasn't true, because then by doing some measurement, you could find out about physics all the way up to the, to the you know, arbitrarily high energy by doing lots of lots of calculations and lots of measurements sensitive to high energy physics. But in practice, it isn't there. Our sensitivity goes like one over the heavy scale. So it's good in some ways that we're insensitive to it because then we can do calculations at our energies. But we can't uh, learn about the, the physics beyond where we are doing our experiments, except by heavy, very suppressed stuff. So the, you know, the one game in physics is to look for the suppressed stuff, but our reach on that is limited. Yes? Um, um, does this always lead to the, to the same um, measurement values of the electric charge and, and the mass? Because when we, when we include the right. we are, our electric charge changes. Right. Yeah, so it, if, you knew, if you really, really, really knew what the bare charge was, Let's say you had a perfectly good theory like, let's imagine string theory worked out beautifully, okay? And we knew that, that somewhere in string theory there was a bare charge that was the bare electric charge. And then we measured the, the, the final one. And we could calculate everything in between there. We could actually be sensitive to Z effects because it shifted 
the, the physical charge from the bare charge by some amount. But since we don't know what that bare charge is, we, we don't really have any sensitivity to, to that effect. Yes, it has shifted. The, the Z has shifted the electric charge by some amount. But we don't know. And, and we, can, we can calculate in perturbation theory what that is. But we can't get a handle on it. It turns out, actually, it's, it's infinite if you do the calculation. But OK. But, but maybe it's not. You know, it, It's infinite in the limited calculation that we did. But we don't know what all the intermediate states are up there. So maybe it's really finite. Okay. So, in fact, that, let me do that part. But does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So, the, the, then, let's just do a little bit now. So that was the ubiquity of, of infinities. Now let's do the philosophy for the moment. Okay. So one, if you're in condensed matter, you don't worry. Okay, so for example, if if let's let's imagine that the phi is a phonon. Okay, if phi was a phonon, phonons are are vibrations in elastic solids, and high momentum phonons really don't exist. Describing it as a continuum field is breaks down at some stage. So if if lambda is less than one angstrom, you know, the interatomic distances, there aren't anything that that have any phonons that have wavelengths. So there's a real cutoff. There's a a, a physical cutoff. And so there's no infinity. There's still effects from from very you know energy scales up to or wavelengths down to a, a an angstrom, but that all goes into renormalization and but, but there's not no infinities. Okay, you know part, people that do high energy high energy physics folks. Well, you can you the, the standard expectation is that you, know, you look you know you hope for a a finite fundamental theory. Okay. And you know, string theory makes that claim that it's finite. So string theory is an example. Or maybe the phonon example is a good idea that maybe maybe the description of photons as fundamental fields breaks down at some scale and there there doesn't make sense beyond some scale. So that we get a fi a finite theory too. Yes. Can you say what, what do you mean by finite? Finite means that the infinities never really occurred. Okay, so the, you know, so the infinities come from this this very high energy end which we haven't probed, and so maybe since it's an experimental science, something's going to happen up there that makes it nice and finite. One thing is could be that there's a real physical cutoff in nature, that space-time distance is less than something doesn't make any sense, or you could have the string theory where string theory amplitudes. There are new particles, new interactions, and they make the theory finite. So those are two of That's at least worth. Um, some people worry that it's an artifact of perturbation theory. And 
that maybe if you did this thing perfectly well, non-perturbatively, that you'd get around it. That's not been very fruitful. Uh, you know, it's not, I wouldn't suggest you dedicate your career to trying to prove that. Okay. Perhaps gravity solves it. Of course, gravity is, is, has these problems also, but perhaps you combine them up. There was, actually has been some successful work on that. It's a little bit speculative because we don't know what's going on up there for gravity, but, but Abdus Salam was at one stage tried to do that. But the, the last thing is to just do it. Okay, by me, which I mean, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, we're going to go through a bunch of techniques. The, the, the infinities drop out in all physical answers. They never make any, they never come back to haunt you. So if you just do it and hope for the best, it always works. Okay. So that's, that's one I stopped there, nice philosophical thing. We'll come back next time. I'm going to talk about the topic I'm going to talk about is regularization. How do you actually make the integrals finite to handle them? Because handling infinities is always dangerous. And then I come back after that back to the physics of the, the so we're in this interlude of handling loop integrals. And we come back then after that to again the physics of renormalization, renormalizing masses and wave functions and coupling constants, and et cetera. Okay. So then we'll have the tool to do it a good job on that. Okay? Good. See you next time. Very good.